Hello, welcome to my latest video. This is the second one I've done about the 100 Club. The first one was more of a general history. This is about my experiences there, both good and not so good. This is going to offend some people. It'll be here after this musical introduction. So, the 100 Club, it's um, one of the oldest clubs in the world. Apparently there's something about it being like the oldest continuous live music venue in the world or, or, or something. Not sure that's strictly true, but anyway, it's a good thing to get the tourists, isn't it? And basically, um, the first video I did about the Wonder Club is, I do a link to that up there somewhere. So if you want to watch that first, that's more of a general history. This is more my experiences. So I first went to the Hunter Club back in the 1970s or 1980s. I definitely saw some punk stuff there. Um, I put on some stuff there um, and it was a great place to go. It is a great place to go. It's very atmospheric. It's a small club. It's like, it's always been privately run as far as I know. It's um, very good. But I started putting on shows there in the, I think the 1980s, I think probably. Um, at the time it was run by Roger Horton, who is the father of Jeff Horton, who is currently the owner stroke manager there. And um, back then, just about everything I used to do music wise was being done by someone else. So I had to put on rock and roll, which didn't really work particularly success successfully because I wasn't part of any of the tribes, the rock and roll tribes of the time. Like in the 70s and 80s, there were like rockabillies and Teds and Hells Angels and all kinds of things. And I wasn't any one of those because I've never been one to join things like mods or anything like that. So I've not, so the people who went to that sort of thing mistrusted outsiders and I was definitely an outsider. So anyway, Roger came to me one day and says, I don't think this is working, is it? Maybe if you'd like to think of something else and come back and do something else. So I did, so that was that. Then I went off and I, for forgot about live music for a while and I went and started the Do Not Press publishing house and I pu published books and I worked at Time Out and I wrote about music and stuff. But then in about 2000, I think it was, I wanted to put on live shows again. The Do Not Press was artistically very successful but not financially, so I I, I also I felt, felt the urge to get back into doing some live music. So I wanna see Jeff and he, gave me one night thing to start with and then I did and that worked very well that sold out I think I, I can't remember who I did but it was a very successful night and then I did another one and then eventually we're doing twice a month and then I think once a month to start with then twice a month and then eventually I was doing every Friday night and they were doing very well in fact at the time I'm not sure I should say this but Certain members of staff told me that it was taking more money on a Friday night than it was the rest of the week put together. And I was, in fact, keeping the Hornet Club going, which is good to hear. I think Jeff told me that once or twice. That was good to hear because we put on some Friday night stuff and it was like, it was like a regular thing. We got a lot of people come in. We had a lot of acts coming in from the States, like Hot Tuna. We had a lot of big, bigger names, like um, Roy Harper did several nights there for me. All sorts of things really worked well and it was really good. And we just had, I was putting on Wilco Johnson regularly once a month, Stackridge, Tony McPhee, Stroke the Groundhogs, lots and lots and lots, Nine Below Zero the Blockheads, lots of things, a lot of Scar stuff. I was putting on Desmond Decker regularly. I was putting on, um, I did Derek Morgan, you know, the great Scar legend from um, Jamaica. All these things, putting them all on and it was great. And um, in about, well, in the year 2006, I started the Rhythm Festival. And this is the first um, tweak really that I realized things weren't quite right with me and the Hunter Club because I was allowed to put up posters to promote my festival at the Hammersmith at Apollo, at the Forum, the Town and Country Club, at the Mean Fiddler, at the Borderline, at all these venues apart from the 100 Club because Jeff was the only person that wouldn't let me put a poster up. So anyway, that was that. Um, even to the extent that I did flyers, which one side had what was happening for my gigs at the 100 Club, and then on the other side had the Rhythm Festival lineup and book your tickets and all that. And I'd leave those on the shelf as you walk into the 100 Club, and then I'd come back a few days later to see if there were more needed, and they'd be gone. Very strange, which is, um, 
I, I, which again, I never really got my head around that because I thought it was a bit weird, but um, there you go. I think part of Jeff's problem with me was that he wanted me to do 52 weeks of the year there, and I was only doing something like 46 or something because I had to promote the Rhythm Festival, which meant I had to go to festivals, which meant that July and August, which not a good months putting on live music anyway, it meant that I had to go and promote festivals. So I wasn't doing those two months I think he wanted me to. So that was a stumbling block between me and him. Jeff has a certain way of doing things and he, he may have changed in the meantime, I hope he has, but back then there were little things that um, irked me. For example, one of the big ones that irked me was that the answer machine, they used to have an answer machine. So people didn't answer, the, sorry, people didn't answer the phone if there's no one in the office. And also, if there's, even if there were people in the office, they often didn't answer the phone. So there was an answering machine, which was supposed to say what was on for that night and the next few nights. Now, normally that would be okay, that's great, but from time to time, nobody changed it. So I can remember one particular time, the answer machine said for quite a long time, I mean, it was weeks rather than days, said, tonight's show is sold out, and so don't bother coming down, coming around the club. And this stayed up for quite a long time. And that was like an irksome thing, and I did complain about that. And um, the manager at the time told me I was being um, disloyal and all that sort of stuff. But I don't think it's being disloyal, because I just wanted people to come to the show to spend my money. The little things like that, plus as well, like at venues I promoted, apart from the Wood Under Club, you could say, I would like 100 chairs, I would like this, I would like that, and everything would be ready for you when you turned up. At the Wood Under Club, if you wanted 100 chairs, you would have to get them out yourself. I mean, and occasionally Richard, who was Jeff's brother, would help me, but, but that was a bit irksome. And also the fact is that sometimes I turned up and the place was full of tables and chairs, which I then had to put back into the place where the tables and chairs go which again if you're paying quite a lot of money to hire a, a, a venue you don't really want to do all that so anyway there were little problems like that which is no big deal but then what happened was in about 2008 I think or it might mean 2009 the Wonder Club was in danger of closing now this was there was a campaign started I think Jeff made an announcement about it the fact that he couldn't pay the rent and the and the rates was very high and the club was actually struggling and I'm, and I know that my Friday nights were doing okay, but that was about all. A lot of the other stuff wasn't doing okay. And it was very hard to make a club work if you're just doing one or two good nights and then the rest are not very good at all. So we had, there was a campaign going on. I remember ringing up Jeff when I was out, um, when I heard about it and asked if there's anything I'd do. And he just said, keep doing what you're doing. And so I did. And then what happened was another promoter. This is what really happened why I left the 100 Club. Now I've never told him this, I've never told Jeff this, actually, because um, you will see anyway. So what happened was another promoter approached me and said, look, if Jeff does lose the 100 Club, we're out. It'll be turned into a warehouse or something, or it turned into a restaurant or something else, or someone else will turn up and they'll make it into a different kind of a club. So do you think we should do something about it? So. We eventually, there were a few of us, there wasn't just me, I mean, I was not even the leader of this. I didn't even start this and I wasn't the leader of it. But anyway, there were about three or four of us and we approached, well, actually it was me who approached the landlords because the landlords ate in a restaurant around the corner, which I was told, because a friend of mine ran a restaurant around the corner, which is also owned by this particular landlord and he used to occasionally eat his lunch in there so he told me when he was there so i went to see him and we basically said look we're not trying to get jeff out but if you are going to curtail jeff's lease at the under club we are prepared to take it on within the right terms so don't just let it go to whoever like boots to have a warehouse in there we will look after it so anyway the landlord obviously told jeff this Maybe to use it as like a bargaining chip, I don't know. So anyway, Jeff found out that we were doing it and his attitude towards me changed totally. He never told me this actually, but it's just something I pieced together afterwards. And I did know that he told people I was being d d disloyal, which is definitely not the case from my point of view. But anyway, he had his, his point of view over my point of view. So eventually when the Hunter Club was saved, I think by an injection from uh, Converse Shoes, the Hunter Club was saved and they paid the rent for him and all sorts of things. I was out basically. So Jeff said to me, he needed the Friday nights to be 52 weeks of the year. I was prepared to do it. He got somebody who was prepared to do that. Um, but I could do Sundays I wanted to. Now, Sunday nights was the graveyard of live music promoters. There's a guy called Steve Bakes who's no longer with us, who basically lost everything he had by doing Sunday nights at the 100 Club. He had a house, which he sold and then bought a flat, which he then had a mortgage and sell. And eventually ended up being a nurse, I think, or a 
carer in a um, door seat. So I didn't want that to be me, and I didn't really want to do it Sunday night. So anyway, I don't think it was really a serious thing, because I think Jeff knew that I was not, I knew that Sunday nights were not a good, good night to do. Because to be fair, Jeff did often did suggest I go after Chas and Dave who were doing things for the Sunday night people when he fell out with them. So anyway, Sunday nights were not for me. Um, and what I was, there was a firm came in, a young, putting on young bands that charging them to play and it just died on its ass, and it was terrible. And to this day, I can't understand why he would want somebody like that in there on a Friday night when he could have had me and we were doing like really good. But maybe it was the image, maybe Converse wanted a younger crowd. Who knows? He never told me. I've not spoken to him since. Um, when the borderline closed, because I went to the borderline, well, I was invited to go to the borderline actually, and I'll talk about that in my next video. When I went to the borderline, um, basically that closed last year or the year before, 2019, I think, August 2019, and I had shows already booked in, which were actually sold out. So I off, I thought, well, might as well put them on at 100 Club. So there was months to go. So I offered them to the 100 Club. I contacted the person who does the diary there, and she said she'd get onto Jeff, and Jeff would contact me within, in like a day or two, and arrange it. And, um, well, I'm still waiting for him to contact me. So I just find it a bit weird that, um, just that I was actually, basically, the thing is that if you fall out with Jeff, you're gone. I mean, I believe the guy who even organized the Save the 100 Club campaign was subsequently barred from the club. Maybe not true, but I believe that is the case. Anyways, there you go. That's my experience at the 100 Club. Uh, lots of other people have a fantastic time there and a really positive experience. I did it for a very long time, but I've not been back there since 2010 when I did my last show there, two nights with Wilco Johnson, which ended on New Year's Eve, I think 2009 or 2000, leading up to 2010. So there you go. That's my story of the 100 Club. If you liked it, please like down below. If you didn't like it, please, um, well, don't do anything. Comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you've had a very positive experience at the 100 Club. I mean, I had lots of positive experiences. Don't get me wrong. I love the place. Just that um, it's not really for me anymore because I... I am, um, well, I did go there once actually afterwards and I was speaking to the doorman. I didn't go in the club, but I was speaking to the doorman just in the foyer and the manager at the time came in and she said, aren't you barred or something? So she rang up Jeff and apparently Jeff told the doorman that I wasn't barred, but he, but no, he's told me anything. So I've not been back there since. And that's it. So the next one will be about the borderline, about my experiences there. Both good and not so good. I had a, It was very interesting too, the borderline. We had some very good shows there. And why that closed, and I'll tell you everything in my next video. Thank you for watching, and see you next time. Goodbye.